Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. We were at such a desperate place that Andrew, it was like life. It was just life that was coming from the television. And every area in our life has been turned right side up. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm going to start a brand new series talking about the power of partnership. I have CDs and DVDs on this, and I tell you, this is going to be a powerful teaching for you. I know that when people, especially ministers, go to talking about money, most people head for the exits. They don't like to talk about this, and uh, there is really a resistance about this. But power of partnership not only applies to a ministry or to a church that you're giving to, but it's beneficial to you. And I don't think most people really understood this. If they understood it, well, then they would be involved in more partnership because it is a powerful thing. You know, let me start by <clears throat> just giving a testimony that one of our graduates from our Bible college, he pastored a church up in the mountains of Colorado, and he had just a small church. I think it was around 20 or 30 people. And he wanted me to come minister for him, and yet he had such a small group that he got two other churches to go together. And so all together between three churches, there was some around, somewhere around 100 people that came to this meeting. And because it was a small number of people, they were afraid that I wouldn't get very much money in offerings for doing that. And so they offered to let me take up my own offerings, thinking, I, I assume, that if I was the one that received the offerings, then uh, I couldn't complain about the results. So anyway, they asked me if I'd receive the offerings, and it didn't matter to me. I usually let whoever, wherever I am, they receive the offerings, and they can give me nothing, or uh, it doesn't matter. I never go anywhere because of money. So anyway, they asked me to receive the offerings, and I had just come from a meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, and this has been many years ago. It's 20-something years ago. I don't remember the exact amount of money, but I know that that uh, church in Charlotte, North Carolina, has given me anywhere from 50000 to a hundred or three, one time $300,000 for a week's meetings. Uh, I, it's the biggest gifts, the biggest giving of any church that I've ever been a part of. So anyway, I had just come from that church. I don't think I even went home. I flew into Denver and I went immediately up into the mountains to this church. And so they asked me to receive the offerings and I got up and I, I started by saying, look, I just came from a church that gave me a huge offering. I am not a poor pastor that just barely got into town. And if you don't give, I'm not going to be able to get out of town. I'm not here because I need things. I don't need your money. And that's the way I started. And when I did that, you could just see the, all of the blood drain out of the face of this pastor on the front row. He thought, oh, he just killed the offering. Because again, most people... The way that they receive an offering is all about, I've got a need. Would you please help me? And I understand that. You know, the Bible says that if you see your brother or sister in need, and if you shut up your bowels of compassion, how dwelleth the love of God in you? So there is giving when you see a person in need. That is a valid reason to give. But it's probably the simplest motive for giving. It's the easiest to uh, motivate people to give. But that's not all that there is to it. Giving is for you. And when I go to teaching on finances, this isn't for me, this is for you. You know, when I teach on healing, I don't teach on healing for my sake. Now, it does benefit me because as I believe the Word and as I speak it out of my mouth, I get blessed by it and I believe that it helps me. There have been times when I was fighting some type of sickness in my own body that I decided I was going to teach on healing because I needed to hear it. And so, yes, it benefits me in a sense, but the reason I teach on healing isn't so that I can be healed. It's to share the truth with you so that you can be healed. The reason I teach on emotions and on walking in joy and how to believe God and how to do all these things, I don't do it for me. I do it for you. But when you start t talking about money, people immediately think, that it is totally selfish that the reason I teach on finances is because I need finances. And again, I, you know, I need finances, and God will bless me, but I want to share with you the benefit that giving has to you. 
And see, that's the way that I approached this receiving the offering for this, these three little churches that went together. And that's how I started. And I said, look, it's not about what my need is. You need to give. You need to be a part of what God is doing. You need to take a portion of what God has given you, and you need to use it for something besides yourself. I use the example of giving being like a seed, and there's many places that say that, but over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, that's one of the clearest examples in verses uh, 6 through 10, and it talks about God gives seed to the sower. And so anyway, I began to teach that if you eat all of your seed and don't plant some of it, then you're going to be hungry. You might be full at the moment, but you're in the future going to be hungry. You have to recognize the potential that is in that seed for your future, and you have to discipline yourself and plant some of it, or you're going to be hungry tomorrow. So I began to teach all of these people these things. And anyway, it was, it was really good. And the next week after the meeting was over, uh, I had the pastor of that little church called me, and he explained to me that, you know, when I started saying that I don't need your money, this is about what you need. You need to learn about partnership. He said that, man, he was just, uh, he thought that that had killed the offering, but it turned out that they wound up giving the largest offering to me that they had ever given to anybody, so that was good. But the main thing was, he said on Sunday morning, He got up in front of his church, and this is after the three churches had gone their separate ways. So there was only 20, maybe 30 people maximum in his church. And he got up and he told the people, he says, you know, I don't remember the messages that Andrew taught on. All I remember are those offering talks. And he says, I was so touched by that. And he says, I knew these things, but I hadn't shared them with you because, again, there is a resistance to ministers. People just immediately think that you're doing this only for selfish motivation, selfish reasons. And so there is a resistance and an unbelief that is mixed with it. You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, that the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And there is a resistance to ministers talking about prosperity. You just nearly always think that it is for selfish reasons that people do this, and it's a manipulation in a way to get finances. So anyway, there's unbelief mixed with it, and it usually just doesn't do any good. So this pastor said that because of the resistance and because of the criticism against ministers for talking on finances, he says, I haven't been honest with you. I knew these things, and personally, he operated in giving, but he says, I didn't challenge you because I was afraid you would think, I was doing it for the wrong motivation. And he got up in front of his church, and he actually got to cry. And he fell on his knees, and he says, Please forgive me for not telling you the truth. Please forgive me that I have robbed you and taken away opportunities for you to prosper because I was afraid of what people would think. And he repented in front of his whole church. And the people in his church came up. And remember, it was just a small church, 20, 30 people. They came up and they started hugging him and saying, Pastor, we forgive you. And people started giving and they paid off. They they gave so much money. I don't remember the amount, but I think it was over $20,000, $20,000 or $30,000 that they gave on that Sunday morning, paid off the entire church indebtedness and caused prosperity to come. And this pastor contacted me the next week and told me all of this and said, it has sparked a revival in our ministry. And I tell you, this is the power of partnership. You know, let me start with this verse over in Luke chapter 16. And, you know, this used to be a problematic passage of Scripture to me. I would read it, and I just couldn't understand exactly what was uh, being said. Now, I've got a lot that I want to share, so I'm I'm not going to go into the depth on this that I typically do. I've got other teachings. I've got a teaching entitled, Uh, stewardship, financial stewardship, and it goes into much more detail. This teaching is only two teachings about the power of partnership. That financial stewardship, I think, is six different teachings, and it incorporates some of these things. This is going to focus specifically on how partnership helps you, what it does in your life. This other teaching goes into just detail on uh, prosperity and all kinds of other things. And so I'm not going to go into the detail, but let me just summarize. Then in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, 
it gives a, a story about a man who is a steward of another man. A steward is a person who manages the affairs of another person, not their own money, but they manage somebody else's money. And this man had been accused that he had been stealing money from his master. And so the master confronted him and says, show me the books, and if what I've heard is true, then you're going to be out of a job. And this man panicked because he had been stealing money from his master, and he knew that he was going to be fired. And he said here in verse 4, this is humorous to me, he says, what am I going to do? He says, when I am put out of the stewardship, that means that's his admission of guilt. And this is in verse 3. He answered within himself, what shall I do for my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship? That's his admission of guilt. And he said, I cannot dig to beg, I'm ashamed. And this is amazing to me. He says, I cannot dig, I can't work. I don't know that there is any reason to think that he physically was incapable of working. It was probably more like he wouldn't work. Most people who are thieves have an aversion to work. They're trying to get rich quick, uh, you know, with little effort. But anyway, he says, I cannot dig, and to beg, I'm ashamed. This is amazing to me that he wasn't ashamed to steal, but he was ashamed to beg. It's amazing how people can have a selective con conscience. I tell you, you ought to be ashamed if you steal. So anyway, what he did, he called all of his master's debtors together, and he discounted them, some of them 50%, some of them 30%, and he would just say, sit down and say, let's say, for instance, that if you owed $100,000, if you'll give me $50,000 right now, we'll settle your bill and we will make it clear. And so what he did, he discounted their debts, and the purpose behind it was that when he was kicked out of the stewardship, he'd be able to go knock on the doors of all of these people that he had discounted their debts and say, do you remember what I did for you? I've gotten fired. I need help. Could you help me? And these people would feel obligated to give him a house or food or let him stay there or help him in some way. So he was still stealing money from his master. He was discounting the money that was owed to his master without his master's permission. So he was still stealing money. But now, instead of sticking the money in his pocket, he was putting it in other people's pockets, in a sense, as a bribe so that he could have some help from them when he lost his job. And this, you know, that's not so unusual up to there. But here's the strange part. In verse 8, it says, The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Now, this is what always stumped me, is why would he commend this guy? And again, I've got hours of teaching on this. I'm only going to say this very quickly, and then I'm going to move on specifically to talking about partnership. But there's two reasons. Well, let me just focus on this one thing. I think that the reason that he commended this steward is because finally he began to realize the power of money to affect your future. Prior to this time, this man had stole money from his master, but he had nothing to show for it. And you can prove that because in the third verse, he says, what am I going to do when I lose my job? I can't dig to beg. I'm ashamed. That shows you that he hadn't stored any up. He hadn't invested. He had been just consuming it. He had been taking whatever he could get from his master, and he had blown the entire thing. And so he was short-sighted. He had not done anything with this money, but now that he was going to lose his job, he started recognizing, I'm in a position where I can influence people with this money that I manage from my master. And he began to start using money to affect his future. Now, that's the reason that the master commended him. And I wish I had more time to go into all of the detail, but let me just say this quickly, that money gives you power. Now, some people will be offended at that and think, oh, well, man, you shouldn't look at that. You know, well, money does give you power. Did you know that if you had a million dollars, you can approach buying a house, buying a car, doing something differently than a person who has nothing and isn't even sure that they can qualify for a loan? It gives you options. You have uh, access to different things than people that don't have money. Money does give you power. There is some security in money. Now, we shouldn't put our faith in money. We ought to put our faith in the one who has prospered us and has given us money, that is God. But I'm saying that, you know, if you had money, if you were a billionaire, there are things that you can do that you can't do if you don't have money. 
Also, it has influence that goes with it. You have a billionaire walk in, people are going to treat him differently than a person who's a beggar off the street. So whether you like it or not, uh, it, it does give you influence. It gives you power. It gives you ability to do things that you couldn't do if you don't have money. And so there is power in money, but the sad thing is most people are using that power, that influence, short-sighted. They are blowing it on things here, and they aren't long-term thinkers. If you go back to one of the things I said at the very beginning of this program, that it's like seed. Money is like seed. Mark chapter 4, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, there's many places that use seed to illustrate money. And that's a good illustration because seed, you can eat it and it can give you nourishment and it can help you momentarily, but seed also can be planted and it can grow up and produce more seeds for the future. And if you are just short-sighted and if you eat all of your seed, then you're going to be hungry someday in the future. But if you can discipline yourself and recognize the power that's in this seed, not only for temporary things, but for future things, then praise God, man, you can affect your future. And if you would discipline yourself and be faithful to sow, and you do this not just once, but every time you get some seeds, you sow a portion. And if you do that long term, then in the future, you will have such an abundant harvest that you couldn't eat it. You couldn't consume it all. You will have more than what you could ever handle. But very few people will discipline themselves and think about the future. The reason that this unjust steward was commended was because for the first time in his life, even though he was still stealing, he at least started recognizing the power that was in money to affect his future. And the master commended him. Now, here is Jesus giving the reason that he gave this par parable. So here is the application in verse 9. He said... Un and I say unto you, Jesus was speaking, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, this is Old English. This is King James that I'm reading from, but it's not that hard to understand. He's just saying that you use money, and the word mammon here, he uses this again in verse 13. And you know, a friend of mine, Creflo Dollar, he's got a great teaching on mammon. It's not just money. It's talking about that spirit that is behind money. But anyway, for the sake of understanding right here, this is saying that use money to touch people's lives, to make friends, so that when you fail, and this same word that was translated fail in verse 9 was translated die other places. So this is saying use money to touch people, to make friends, so that when you die, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So the purpose of this parable is to say that this man had been stealing money, but he had just blown it on temporary things. He was buying flat screen TVs and caviar and, and t you know things like that, just blowing it on temporary things. He didn't invest it. He didn't think about his future. But when he was confronted with being fired, he finally started using money to touch people's lives and affect his future. Jesus is saying, likewise, recognize the power that's in money. Use money to touch people's lives so that when you die and enter into heaven, there will be people lined up to welcome you into heaven. I don't know how many of you have ever heard this song about uh, a man who dreamed that he went to heaven and when he got there, there was just people lined up and they started saying, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. And he says, well, when did I ever touch you? I mean, there were people from the other side of the world that were dif different ethnic groups. And he says, when did I ever touch you? And the song goes on to say that, you know, uh, that in Sunday school class, a missionary came and you gave an offering and that offering was used to send this missionary to bring the gospel and they were a life that was changed. They wouldn't have heard the gospel if it hadn't have been for that missionary. And through the gifts that this person gave, all of these lives that were changed. Now that's a song, but it's based on this verse right here. And this is literally what Jesus is saying. When you give and when you sow into the gospel, if you do it in faith, now that's a big if, but that's true. If you do it in faith, 
then that money never leaves your life. It just enters into your future where it grows and it multiplies. And the promise is in uh, Mark chapter 10 that you receive it back a hundredfold in this life. That means that your return is not only in eternity, but you get a hundredfold return on everything that you sow in this life. Now, I'm going to be talking about this, and there's some people that don't believe that, but it is what the Scripture says. God promised 100-fold return on your gifts in this life and in the world to come, everlasting life. And so it affects you not only in this life, but it will affect you in eternity. And just like Jesus is saying, people will literally be lined up to welcome you into heaven. Now, you know, if you make it to heaven which I pray that you do. I pray that every person watching this program has made Jesus your Lord and you're on your way to heaven. Now, if you haven't done that, praise God. Call the number on your screen. Pray with somebody. Get born again and guarantee your entrance into heaven. But there are... So if you go to heaven, that's going to be a blast. And there is no bad way to get to heaven. But wouldn't you like, instead of just barely squeaking into heaven and you get there and there's nobody to greet you, wouldn't it be awesome if you got there and you saw people just lined up? I mean, mile after mile after mile of people who your giving touched their life while they were here on this earth and their life was changed. And because of that, there's people lined up to welcome them. You know, I think about Billy Graham who died just, you know, a little over a year ago at the time I'm making these programs. And I guarantee you, Billy Graham probably preached to more people than possibly any other man in history. And he led probably more people to the Lord than possibly any other person in history. Now, Jesus gets the credit. It was Jesus who was flowing through him. But nonetheless, based on these scriptures, can you imagine that when he enters into heaven, the millions and millions of people that were lined up to welcome into him into heaven and to cheer him. Man, isn't that awesome? Think about all of the money that he invested in these crusades. Think about all of the time, the effort that he spent flying places and doing things. And all of that money that he spent and put into touching people's lives, it came back to him 100-fold in this life. His ministry prospered. God blessed him, but in eternity... I guarantee you, he is just reveling in all of the effort that he put into touching people's lives. And that same thing is true about us. So I, this is all introduction, but tomorrow I'm going to start getting into more detail and talking about the power of partnership for you. It's obvious that when you give to a church or to a ministry that it blesses them. But man, it is, it is not as obvious what that partnership does for you. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. And I tell you, if you can receive these things that we're talking about, it will bring you new, to a new level. It will give you... You'll start sowing on purpose instead of just emotionally giving when somebody uh, asks you for something. And it will cause huge difference not only in this life, but in the one to come. Remember that we've got CDs and DVDs on the power of partnership. There's two teachings in here. If you want to become a partner with us, we're going to be giving you some information about that, but we will sow this into your life just so that you can get the full benefit of your partnership. But listen to our announcer as he gives you this information, and please call or write today. To me, I mean, to partner with Andrew Womack Ministries is just getting these truths out there. You want to put your money and your resources and your effort where other people of like mind want to put theirs. If it can change other people's lives like it's changed my life, then I would be just selfish to not give back into and to share this to the rest of the world. Jamie and I are here just to thank you so much for being partners with us. I tell you, we are reaching around the world. I remember when Jamie and I were it. I would run the sound while she was doing the praise and worship, and then she'd come back and run the sound while I was preaching. We did it all ourselves. Now we have so many people helping us and it couldn't happen without you. It's very true. We're very thankful for our partners and what they're doing and you're going around the world too and everything that this Amen. ministry does. Amen. So we just wanted to say a special thank you 
And uh, we love you. And every good thing that is happening through this ministry, you're going to share in every one of those rewards. So God bless you. Thank you for being a partner with us. If you're not already a partner, you can become a Grace Partner today by calling our helpline or going to awmi.net. As a thank you for becoming a partner, Andrew would like to offer you the CD album of today's teaching on the power of partnership as his gift to you. Also available today is the Power of Partnership package, which includes the Financial Stewardship book, the Financial Breakthroughs DVD, and your choice of either the Power of Partnership CD or DVD album. This package has a catalog value of $55, but you can get it today for only $39. For those of you who would like to be partners with us, we've got a lot of things going on. And the thing that right now that the Lord has really laid on my heart is to get our parking garage paid off as quickly as possible. We actually have a $23 million loan on that 1,022 space parking garage. It's five stories tall. And I tell you, it is such a blessing. We are using it. It's a godsend, but we need to get it paid off. And the Lord laid on my heart to just ask for 23,000 people to give $1,000. And I know that that's a lot of money for some people. For other people, it's not a problem. But you know, if you gave $100 a month for 10 months, it would only take 10 months for us to come up with that. And if we get this paid off within just the next few months, I'll save nearly $7 million in interest. And if the Lord has led you to join with us, we have what we call a 1K club, and you can contact us. We have the number on your screen. Let somebody know about it because we need to designate this money towards that. But we believe that we're getting our parking garage paid off quickly And thank you for being a part of this. Join with Andrew and become part of the 1K Club today by going to awmi.net or calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Remember, you can order materials, become a Grace Partner, or join the 1K Club by going to awmi.net. Or you can call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I'd like to encourage you to call in. And I know that God is speaking to many, many people, and you may have had the Lord touch you today. And if you just need somebody to touch and agree with you, the scripture says, if any two of you agree touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. So we have these people, I mean powerful people who love God and are equipped in the Word of God. They're there to pray with you and help you. The number is 719-635-1111. That's 719-635-1111. 